first lesson is from Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when we and Ruth live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down from the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordained his blessing, life evermore. The word of the Lord. The second lesson is from 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and declared to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Word of the Lord. Thanks. Please stand for the Gospel action.
Christ. Amen. So, you know, when I first moved out here, Pastor Kendall and Emily took me on a tour of town. It didn't take very long. Five minutes later, we were back at church, I think. But while we were out touring the town, we stopped by the football field, the baseball field, down over there. And Pastor Kendall explained to me that on those fall nights, you would get cars lining around the hill of the football field, cheering on the blackjacks as they took the field, honking their horns. And of course, nobody sits at these games. There's only one set of bleachers. Uh, so most people either stay in their cars and watch the game, they're up on the hill, or they're down walking the sidelines as if they're walking with the team as they make that drive down the field to score a touchdown, which, of course, after we score the touchdown, there's more honking of horns. It's tradition. I think Pastor Kendall was getting a little bit nostalgic talking about it. It was kind of reveling in the enjoyment of reliving each of those moments. And at the time, I didn't really know what to expect. But of course, after this last season, I got to experience these moments, the horns honking, I got to experience the walking up and down the sidelines, I got to experience a lot of the success that the football team had this year as they made that run to the state championship game. And Pastor Kendall, on this tour of town, told me about all of the recent success that the football team has had. They've had a lot of confidence because they've had so much success. There's a lot of faith and hope in the football program. Well, I've never played football competitively. I did play baseball. And so since we were down by the football field and the baseball field was right there, I happened to ask Pastor Kendall, well, so how's the baseball team? And Pastor, I see some people smiling. Pastor Kendall said the baseball team has not had as much success uh, in recent years. Not as much success as the football team. There isn't that same confidence that's with the football team. Well, I went to our baseball home opener on Friday, and I, I'm sure some of you were there. If you weren't there, uh, I encourage you to come out and watch. They, uh, they played one heck of a baseball game on Friday, uh, and it was came up just one run short on Friday. Uh, it was a tough loss, but the thing that I drew from it is that despite the past years of having tough season after tough season, talking with some of the baseball players and talking with some of the people at the game, you didn't get the sense that there was any doubt in this team. You didn't get the sense that we couldn't win a game. Instead, you had the sense that there was this faith, this trust, and this confidence that this year we're going to improve, we're going to get better. And even though this game on Friday ended with a loss, talking with some of the players after the game, you still got the sense that, gosh, we are so close. And there was still this confidence, this faith that it will happen, it will get there. Things will continue to improve. I think it's a fine line between faith and doubt. I think they're two sides of the same coin. Where one is close, the other is close by to follow. Of course, we hear the story of Doubting Thomas, and we're quick to say, that's, we should not be like Doubting Thomas. Don't doubt, have faith, right? Doubting is a bad thing. Don't be a Doubting Thomas. No one wants to be called a Doubting Thomas. Yet, I think that simply being told, don't doubt, have faith, doesn't really do a whole lot for removing the doubts that we have. It doesn't eliminate the questions that we have about our faith. If anything, it may actually leave us wondering if we actually believe enough, if we are good enough, if we have enough faith. Thomas 
as you'll remember, is painted as this bad guy, the guy who didn't have faith. And you can imagine the other disciples sitting there saying, Oh, Thomas, shame on you. You should have faith, Thomas. You should believe. Don't doubt. But of course, how easily we forget that just a few verses earlier, these same disciples were huddled together, locked in a house, wondering about what to do next. That doesn't exactly scream faithful disciples of others. Faith isn't exactly bubbling over in these disciples, and it isn't until they see Jesus that they begin to believe as well. Thomas needs proof. And I think that this is something that resonates with our time and culture. We live in a time where we need evidence. You have to be able to prove what you're talking about, otherwise doubt comes into play. We live in an age of skepticism, and skepticism seems to leave little room for faith. If there isn't physical, tangible proof, then our culture says, I'm not sure you can really claim that it's true. The problem we have when it comes to faith is that there is very rarely proof. In fact, there might be no proof at all. But this is the very nature of faith. Faith, by its very definition, is trusting in something even when there is a mysteriousness about it, even when absence is still there. So, when it comes to Easter and the Resurrection, we're about 2,000 plus years removed from that. And yet we claim to be an Easter people. We claim to be people who follow the risen Christ. But of course, we weren't there when Christ was raised. We weren't there when they showed up to the tomb and the tomb was empty, we weren't there as the disciples were huddled together in that house, and we weren't there when Thomas demanded that Jesus provide proof that he is indeed risen. So we don't exactly have physical proof because we weren't there, and yet we are all still here, gathered as people of faith, there's this dilemma, this confliction between faith and doubt. We have a need to see things with our own eyes. Philosopher Soren Kierkegaard wrestled with this very issue, and he said that intuition and reasoning will get you only so far. It will only bring you to the edge of a big, ugly, unsurpassable ditch. A ditch that, by our own reason, we look at it and we say, there is no way that I can get across that ditch. There is no way that I can jump and get across that ditch. But Kierkegaard says, this is where faith comes in. Because despite the absence of having proof that we can make that jump, faith tells us, jump, take that leap, you can make it across. It is only through faith that we can begin to take that jump, and it is only through faith that we realize that we can indeed make it across this ditch. But where do we find this faith? Where does one find this faith. Where does this faith come from? It comes from God's activity in our lives and the ways we experience that. It comes through the Holy Spirit in the waters of our baptism. It comes in the body and blood of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
Faith is something that comes to us. It's not something that we can earn or somehow work harder and build more faith. Faith comes when we hear the words, this is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. This is shed for you. Who is it for? Oh, come on. Who is it for? For you. This body and blood is shed for you. These are the words that we need to hear over and over again. These are the words that stir up faith in our lives. This is my body and blood shed Okay, turn to your neighbor and tell them, the body and blood of Christ is shed for you. But does this faith eliminate doubt in our lives? I don't think so. We still have doubts, and yet we still have this desire to not be doubting Thomas's. But I want to point out that while Thomas needed proof, Jesus doesn't withhold that proof from Thomas. So even in the midst of our doubts, God does not say, you have to figure it out. God says, I wish you could see and trust without, I wish you could believe and trust without seeing. But if you need to see, this is my body and this is my blood. God is made present in those times, even when doubts come up. So what do we do when we are filled with doubt? Well, we're all here. We come here to be a part of this community of faith where we love and support and encourage one another. We come here each and every Sunday to be strengthened in our faith we come, doubts and all, to hear once again that this is my body and this is my blood and it's shed for you. So I invite you to come. I invite you to come with all your faith, with all your doubts. I invite you to come because Christ in the bread and wine gives us the courage to take that leap of faith and leave our doubts behind. Amen. Let's stand and confess our faith. With and for each other, we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord. He was conceived by the Father of the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered in the house of Pilate, was crucified by God and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand.